Astronomers have just used the remains of exploded stars to detect the faint whisper of the universe. They've been listening out for this signal for over 15 years, but only now have been able to pick it up. Turns out it's rather hard. What's this noise coming from? Well, they're not too sure yet. It might be a collision of supermassive black holes from the early universe, which is pretty cool in itself. But there's also a possibility of some more peculiar things like cosmic strings. Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Liu, and this week I'm talking about the gravitational wave background detection and pulsar timing arrays. So let's begin. In the late 1960s, Jocelyn Bell Bernal was a PhD student at the University of Cambridge working in the field of radio astronomy. During her research here, she was analyzing data from this monster of a radio dish, the Mullard Radio Astronomy Observatory. She noticed a series of regular radio pulses coming from a single source on the sky. Originally, she and her PhD supervisor at the time, Anthony Hewish, thought that the signals could be coming from intelligent alien life. But later, they concluded the pulses were coming from a rapidly rotating neutron star, or dead star that they called a pulsar. The discovery of the pulsar went on to receive a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1974, but it caused a huge controversy because Jocelyn Bell was not recognized for it. Instead, her supervisor, Anthony Hewish, and another radio astronomer, Martin Ryle, took all the credit. And this not only drew attention to the challenges women face in science, but also problems faced by students with their supervisors. Anyway, these pulsars are neutron stars, so the incredibly dense remnants of massive stars that have undergone a supernova explosion. But importantly, they are highly magnetized, some of the strongest magnetic fields in the universe, some as much as 100 billion times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. And they're also rapidly rotating, so they can spin thousands of times per second. In essence, these are the lighthouses of the universe, emitting beams of electromagnetic radiation out of their magnetic poles at incredibly precise intervals. These regular intervals, combined with the fact that they're abundant throughout our universe because they're dead stars, make them the ideal timing systems to detect gravitational waves, disturbances in space-time fabric of the universe that are the signatures of the universe's most violent events, so things such as the merger of black holes or neutron stars. In 2015, LIGO already made the first gravitational wave detection using detectors on Earth due to the merging of a binary black hole system. And to date, there have been dozens more. But this detection was completely different. Back in 2005, the Nanograv collaboration began their campaign to measure the timings of 17 millisecond pulsars spread out on the sky. These are the most stable types of pulsars, with their emission arrival times known within microsecond accuracies. The pulsars emit powerful beams of radiation in many different wavelengths, including X-rays and gamma rays, but they're the brightest in radio wavelengths, so that's what they decided to use, radio telescopes. Now, a ripple of gravitational waves will cause the fabric of space-time to stretch and squeeze, and this will cause the arrival times to change when space-time is stretched. It will take longer for the emission to reach us. And instead, when the space-time is squeezed, it will be quicker to reach us. So by figuring out if there's any timing changes of the pulsars over time, we can detect a gravitational wave signal. The signal of gravitational waves is tiny, and you have to be able to measure the pulses time of arrival to better than 100 nanosecond accuracy. That's a hundred billionth of a second. And then there's also the problem that pulsars themselves wobble, so that may offset the timing, and the signal has to pass through all of the gas and dust in our Milky Way before it can reach us. So it's an incredibly difficult to measure signal amongst all of this noise. To help them get better over the course of 15 years, they slowly added more and more pulsars to monitor. And their latest result uses 68 pulsars. 
This is what their detection looks like. It shows the separation between any two pulsars on the sky on the x-axis against the correlation strength on the y-axis. When the correlation is positive, that means the signal emitted from the pulsars are either both early or both late. But if you get a negative correlation, this means that the emission from one pulsar is arriving early, whilst the other one is arriving late. Using Einstein's theory, we would predict that the pulses would arrive simultaneously when they're close to on the sky. They would be out of sync at 90 degrees on the sky, and positive again at opposite ends of the sky. And incredibly, this is exactly what they've seen. There's still a lot of error here, so the signal isn't so conclusive, but there's more data coming and more pulsars coming to this array, which will hopefully improve the detection. But 15 years is such a long time, why has it taken so long? Well, a forced stretch and squeeze is known as a period, and the pulsar timing array is sensitive to nanohertz frequencies, which corresponds to gravitational waves with periods of 10 years. This means it takes 10 years for the signal to repeat itself, to stretch and squeeze. In the last data release, the 10-year release, it wasn't enough data to be sure that there was a signal. But with the 15-year data, it's much more apparent. The stretch, squeeze, and stretch is happening. And that's one big reason why it's nothing like the LIGO Earth-based detectors that are highly sensitive to high-frequency signals with periods of a fraction of a second. Upcoming space-based gravitational wave detectors like ESA's LISA mission due to launch in 2037 will be sensitive to mid-range frequencies with periods of minutes to years. Right now, they're still not quite sure what the source of this tiny signal is, but they think it's likely to be a binary supermassive black hole, the black holes that are believed to reside in the center of all galaxies. If correct, the signal wouldn't just be one pair of supermassive black holes, but many of them occurring over time and the signals slowly adding to this background of gravitational noise. Although supermassive black holes are believed to grow via merging, and although we know of many galaxy mergers, when two galaxies merge together, the supermassive black holes are believed to sink into a binary. The time scale for them to actually merge together could be longer than the age of the universe. This introduces an interesting insight into our detection. It could tell us the frequency of supermassive black hole mergers, but also their environment, so how big they are, how close together they are, and their interactions with their surrounding gas and dust, all of which will influence the time it takes for these monsters to merge together. Although the detected signal is in agreement with what's expected from a gravitational wave background of supermassive black holes merging in the early universe, it's also consistent with cosmic inflation, the rapid expansion of the early universe. This would have produced a background of gravitational waves, which would have been redshifted to lower frequencies as the universe expanded. Another theory is cosmic strings. So these are 1D, very thin, very long structures stretching for billions of light years. They may be the origin of the large scale structure of our universe and give rise to time travel. Right now, pulsar timing arrays aren't sensitive enough to rule out any of these theories and many others, but upcoming space interferometers like ESA's LISA, JAXA's DeSigo, and China's Taiji and Tain Quin missions, all planned for the 2030s, just might. Anyway, that's all for this week's video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share, and subscribe.